this morning. Christ is risen. You say. Christ is risen in me. Let's do that one more time. Christ is risen. He is risen in me. Come on, folks. Like this is Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen in me. Oh wow! I almost like that. Now I know that you meant, folks. It's good to be able to worship together here on this Easter Sunday morning. I, I got to see um, sort of an underneath view down to the floor level. I saw people checking out the flowers. I saw Easter eggs rolling underneath the pews. This is exciting <laughs> being here together um, this morning. And uh, just wanted to let you know my name is Isaac Mundy. I'm a minister here at Trent United Church. It's great to be able to gather as a community of faith this morning. And a few announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, this morning, uh, are young people, any young people who are interested? Does anybody like um, Easter eggs here? Any, any, what, okay, what do we have in Easter egg hunt uh, downstairs with uh, with Rebecca and, and Aaron are going to be uh, are help, actually you want to put up your hands just so that people know who they are, and then at the end of the service, uh, uh, caregivers, parents, grandparents are welcome to go downstairs to meet up with the young people, and also we'll be joining together for a time of fellowship and coffee, and I think I even saw a few treats, and you know, maybe some of you will find some Easter eggs down there as well, so we'll be heading down the middle auditorium, you can go out the door through there, where there is a secret staircase at the back over there, and then if you'd like to be able to use um, our lift, uh, which uh, you may or may not have seen before, you can uh, use that, uh, that direction over there, there's a big number two on that door, um, and that is a lift that you can take down to the middle auditorium as well. Um, for our offering for this morning, folks may have noticed that we have offering plates at the back of the church, and uh, you are more than welcome and invited to make a gift to support the ministry of God's work here in the world. So even if you didn't have a chance to drop off an offering on the way in, you can keep, oh, I missed it. Don't worry, there's always an opportunity to be able to give, and you can drop off uh, any offerings at the back in, uh, in the plate on your way out, or if you'd like to be able to make a gift online, just go to our website and there are directions for how you can make a donation electronically as well. Plus, we even have, do we still have the QR codes in the pews? Does anybody here have a smartphone that you can, you just bring up your phone app, you point it at the QR code, you can make a, a donation, it's amazing. So lots of ways to be able to share in our generosity on this Easter morning. A um, few different, uh, oh, so folks, we are going to be having, there is going to be a cleanup at Camp Quinlalac to help um, our United Church Camp for our local area get ready for the summer season. That is going to be taking place on April 29th. It will be happening from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Lunch is provided, and for more information, you can contact um, Al Anthony, um, and you can reach out to our church office if you'd like to get, that's Al. Al, do you want to just go, go again? Awesome. So that's Al. Just hit him up and he'll give you even more information about, uh, about what's happening. Or you can call the church office to, to get in contact with him as well. We're also, um, I, I think we can save the date for one week before, on April 22nd, uh, which I believe is a Saturday, because we're, we're thinking about the possibility of having um, uh, our um, Trent United Trash Bash, because Quinty, Quinty West is having their Trash Bash. And so we'll probably do some cleanup around the property. We're just working out a few of the details, but just mark your calendar um, April 22nd, because we would love to be able to join together. We had an awesome time last year, and we're looking forward to that possibility in, the, um, in a couple weekends from now. Um, many thanks to everybody who brought in flowers this morning, and uh, we hold all those who um, have had flowers donated in memory of them. Their, we hold their family and friends in their prayers, and we give thanks for the witness of their lives lived as, people's, as people have lived. Um, on April 18th, we are going to be having a coffee house taking place at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be an open mic format, so um, lots of folks I know here are, uh, are talented singers and dancers and poets and uh, quite a few jugglers um, here as well. So whatever talent you have, please bring it on um, on April 18th at 6.30 p.m. and we're gonna have a fun time together of fellowship. Just a reminder to folks that starting on May 1st, which is about three weeks from now, I will be beginning my sabbatical time. I'll be a 
away from May 1st until September 4th uh, of this year. And so we are very grateful to be having Reverend Katie, who will be leading uh, us in worship and pastoral care during uh, the month of May. And uh, Reverend Ed will be coming from June to August. So you folks will be in, in good hands during that time. And we're very grateful to, to them for the leadership that they will be offering during that time while I'll, I will lead the way. Folks, if you know somebody in the congregation who you think maybe would like to be able to um, have a visit or have some support or maybe going through a hard time, um, please let us know at the church office and please let me know so that I can be able to reach out to individuals to both uh, visit and connect and to be able to hold them in prayer as well. Sometimes people think, oh, surely Reverend Isaac already knows about this, but a lot of the time I don't end up hearing um, everything that ends up happening. So please uh, always just keep that in mind if you know somebody who is comfortable having that information passed on to myself here at the church. I'm always uh, wanting to know and to to reach out to folks in times of need. And then as well, we have our prayer chief chain team uh, who is available to serve the prayer needs of Trenton United Family and Friends um, and to have prayers said confidentially for a person or a situation. Please uh, contact Reverend Katie. Um, or you can uh, contact the church office and we can pass that message on to the prayer chain team. I think that those are all of the announcements that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I do know actually um, that the, um, I will be away from the church office tomorrow on Easter Monday, but uh, Catherine is going to be here and uh, she'll be uh, changing her work hours for later in the week, but she will be here tomorrow on Monday and then the office will also be moving into the, uh, into the week. Okay, I think that those are all the announcements that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I'm gonna invite you folks to rise as you feel able, and I'll invite you to greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace, or you can say to the person next to you, Christ is risen, and they can say Christ is risen in me.
folks. Um, is, has anybody had any chocolate so far this morning? That's really good. No, chocolate, no. Uh, all these people uh, <laughs> had some candy and stuff. Yeah, Easter is awesome. And Easter is awesome, too, because we get to share in the story about Jesus' new life. All through the last few days, we've been talking about um, what happened when Jesus went to Jerusalem. He yeah. died. Uh, this is a story of a, a, a man who lived very long ago, but who has done amazing things, and that we call the Son of God in this tradition. But then he comes back to life and is resurrected. And the cool thing about Jesus is he did amazing things then, but he helps us to do amazing things now. Um, but sometimes in our lives, um, we have to wait to be able to do uh, certain things in our lives after we get to certain uh, different ages. And I was thinking maybe we could do a little quiz here just to see if people, uh, if you folks or you folks know in terms of different age limits. Does anybody here know how old we have to be to be able to drive a car? Yeah, 16. 16. Yeah, 16. Um, how old do you have to be to be able to vote? Okay, good. Um, let's see. How old do you have to be to be able to move into the season's retirement home? <laughs> a thousand. A thousand. <laughs> you know what? I should have done my research before. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, yeah, lots of really good guesses. Any of them could be right, for all I know. Um, uh, when do you have to, how old do you have to be to be able to um, get your, your pension in Canada? Does it, has anybody here ever got a pension in their uh, CPP? Um, 65. Oh, 55, 60, 65? Yeah, it depends in terms of when you want to be able to and how much you want to be able to get, right? It's like, a, it's kind of a, a bit of a sliding scale. Um, so lots of different ages to be able to do certain things in terms of uh, in terms of our lives. Um, how old do you have to be to make a difference in the world? Would you say? Ninety-eight. Ninety-eight. <laughs> uh, any age. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> any age. I love your answer there. Really good. I actually wanted to talk to you about somebody named. Um, does anybody actually know who that person is? Right in the middle of that picture, the young person. Right. Is anybody here? Autumn uh, Peltier, yeah, exactly. Um, well, oh yeah, sorry, I put the thing right up on top, so I'm surprised that one people are Yeah, spoiler alert. Autumn Peltier is, can you guess how old she was in that picture? She was 12 years old, and she was going to speak to a bunch of leaders in the country. Justin Trudeau was, was still the prime minister at that time. She is an indigenous young person, and there were several leaders who were very important figures in the indigenous community. But she went and talked to Justin Trudeau, who is the prime minister of our country, and she was saying, I, I need you to make some changes in terms of the ways that um, people use water in our country. Because lots of indigenous communities in our country still don't have clean drinking water. Um, there's lots of pollution in our waterways. And she was wanting to make a difference. And it, she was, I think, kind of scared. And there were even tears that came to her eyes on that day. But she has kept on working. I think that she's 18 years old today. And um, she's continued to keep on talking to politicians, asking them to make a difference in all kinds of different places. And you know what? She has made a big difference in terms of bringing attention to some of those important issues, to look after the world and to look after the water. Yeah, do you want to say something? Okay. And you know what, even this past uh, couple of weeks, there have been some big decisions that um, the Canadian government has kind of come around and decided to protect our waterways, but in, in large, uh, largely response to people like her. Uh, what I want to say to you is that, you know, Jesus made a big difference a long time ago. He came and he talked to people and he said, you know what, even though you might be feeling uh, scared or alone in your life, uh, I'm going to make a difference. My love is going to make a difference in your life. But that love doesn't stop with Jesus. It doesn't just stop on Easter Sunday. That's love that we can carry out into the world. And I think that what we really want to believe is that when, just in the same way that Jesus made a difference, even though people wanted him to die and go away and never be heard from again, he kept on being able to spread that message of joy. And we can too. We can be able to make a difference in our world. 
so I just hope that you all have a sense that no matter what age you are, you can make a big difference in our world as well. Before you head downstairs, I know that you're probably excited about even more possibilities for Easter candy, but before we head downstairs, would you say a prayer with me and would you folks all pray with me too? God of love, we trust that through the risen Jesus, we can make a difference in our world. Help us to resist evil. Spread love, spread love and to see justice. And to see justice. Amen. Amen. Okay, you folks have a fun time downstairs, and I'll uh, talk to you after the service. Leave a couple eggs for me, though. Okay. So, uh,
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Here is this morning's reading. Thanks be to God. We are on our Easter morning. We are here to celebrate together. Um, the last couple Sundays, I told folks here at the church uh, a couple stories about um, uh, some time that I spent in Calgary. I'm going to tell you one more story about Calgary, and then I promise that's the last one for the next little bit, okay? Um, but in terms of this time that we spent in Calgary, uh, I and our, our two kids spent some time there a few weeks ago on March break. Uh, Rebecca had a work commitment out in BC, and so we decided we would go out to Calgary. And I told you before, we ended up having a whole bunch of COVID adventures while we were there. But on the first night that we were there, we didn't know that anybody had COVID at that point. And so all of the different households that we were visiting came together to be able to meet and to spend some time together to share a meal. And when one of our family members arrived uh, at the house, it was still very wintry in Calgary at that point, lots of snow on the ground, and she took off her jacket, and she was wearing a hoodie that looked like this, that said, fear is not love on the hoodie. And when I saw it, I thought, this, this sounds like really churchy and Jesus-y, and, and in a good way, in terms <laughs> of this idea of fear is not love. And so I thought, okay, it's probably like from a church that this individual attends, or maybe it's from some kind of program that a Christian group is running. And I asked her about the, the message on her hoodie. She said, actually, it's not from the church. It is from the Calgary Women's Shelter. Um, she has worked for that organization and the system that um, is there over um, in, in Calgary over the last, uh, well, several decades. And over the past few years, they had done a community consultation where they were talking with lots of different organizations that they had worked with. They were speaking with individuals who had been in the shelter system, and they felt like these four words were words that encapsulated what they were trying to do in the world. The idea of them being able to help people be free from fear, neglect, violence, and abuse. And I found this message in the way that it just stood out to me to be so powerful. And so in the weeks to come, I, I spent some time looking online a little bit more at their website in terms of um, what kind of programs they ran in Calgary and what was the work that they were trying to be able to accomplish. And one of the things that they speak about on their website is this idea that when people have experienced abuse in their lives, often within our society, 
people end up um, looking to people who have experienced that abuse and saying, oh, well, they must have been weak. They must not have had a lot of strength to be able to deal with things. Or maybe they've had patterns in their lives where something has happened where um, this just ends up repeating in their lives. And this is a kind of victim blaming that, that often happens in our world where we see people experiencing persecution or abuse and we end up blaming the victim or saying that somehow they, they are powerless in this world, that they are weak. But the, the work of this Calvary Women's Shelter System and this Fear Is Not Love group is very much focused on working against that idea that this there is weakness and the sense that, in fact, whenever there are situations of abuse, uh, they found that in terms of the system that they were working in, that there was always a response as well of some form of resistance, that there are always acts of resistance that take place. It's just that some acts of resistance can be more hidden than others. When we think about situations of abuse in our world, we often would probably think about acts of resistance being acts taking place where somebody might call the police or leave a situation of abuse. But what the people in this um, shelter system want to highlight is that even in moments where people um, make more hidden acts of resistance, that those are deep signs of strength. It could be a situation of abuse where somebody is um, able to say to themselves, even though they've been called a name or put down in some way, to be able to still say, no, this is not, this doesn't define me. The situation of abuse does not say who I am. Or maybe it's somebody being willing to reach out to a friend and talk when another, when an abuser has been trying to isolate them in some way. It's so important for us to be able to recognize that there are always the possibilities for resistance and also to honor those places of resistance even when we can't see them in situations where there has been abuse or hurt in our world, in our families, in all kinds of different situations. Now, I wanted to speak to you about this on Easter Sunday. Because I believe that the Easter story is a beautiful story. We talk about Easter eggs and we talk about bunnies and, you know, we have pictures of Jesus that are idyllic in a garden. But the story of Easter is also deeply a story of resistance and strength. And all through this past few days, we have been talking about the stories of people who have been accompanying Jesus through his passion and his resurrection. On Monday, Thursday, we spoke about Mary of Bethany, who was a woman who anointed Jesus and offered an example of service that is echoed in the service that Jesus offered his disciples. We hear about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is with Jesus at the time of his death on the cross. And today, what I'd like to speak to you about today, and who I would like to speak to you about today, is Mary Magdalene. We heard, as Carol read to us, the story of Mary Magdalene and the strength that she offered on Easter morning. And I believe that she is um, an embodiment of that message, fear is not love. We can imagine Mary on that morning when she encounters the angel, when she encounters Jesus, and, and perhaps there were some emotions of fear. This wasn't what she was expecting on Easter morning. But eventually, she becomes somebody who goes out and runs to the other disciples. And she was somebody of deep strength. She was the first person in pretty much all the gospel stories to see Jesus. She was an apostle to the other apostles, to the disciples who were in hiding. She was the one to go and speak to all of them and let them know that Jesus was risen. And finally, she was somebody who was willing to go to the tomb even though it was surrounded by the Roman guards, these people who had, um, who, who had done awful things to her friend and teacher, Jesus, who had taken his life, who were the presence uh, of what pe many people saw as strength in that ancient world of Palestine. 
she was willing to go there, to be at the tomb, and to face those people who many would have found to be terrifying. Now, it's sad because in many ways, over the centuries and uh, different periods of time in Christian life, Mary Magdalene has been portrayed as somebody who hasn't really <coughs> been that strong of an individual. Um, I, I want to show you a few different portrayals that people have uh, cast onto Mary Magdalene that have nothing to do, really, with the story of the gospel. Um, sometimes Mary has been seen as an individual who uh, either um, cheated on a number of different partners or was involved in, in sex work in different ways, and it's not bad that Mary had a sexuality, but there's nothing to say this in the different gospel stories, and yet this has been put on to Mary in many different ways. Other writers in the early Christian church described Mary as being hysterical or just a wild individual. Uh, an insult that has been cast against um, so many people over the over the centuries and in a world that often has been very patriarchal within our Christian world. And that Mary was somebody who was kind of a wild individual that was maybe more on the fringes of the Easter story, but that we shouldn't spend too much time focusing on. And then finally, even in some of the more modern portrayals of Mary Magdalene, when you think about Jesus Christ Superstar, or if you think about um, the Da Vinci Code, she's very much defined um, from almost a romantic connection to Jesus, almost being a sort of groupie that is off to the side of who Jesus was. But I truly believe that Mary Magdalene was somebody who was much more than these portrayals that seemed to want her to be um, minimized in many, many ways or seen as weak in the world. The first story that you all <coughs> recognize, you might be wondering, why was, why was that a story that we were focusing on this morning? Why was the story of Mary when she was er earlier on in Jesus' ministry, why, why would that be important for us today? I wanted to underline it because, first of all, it talks about Mary as somebody who faced her inner demons. There was a situation in Mary's life, we're not completely sure what that might have looked like, but where she was having a deep time of inner struggle. Now, in that ancient world, a lot of the time when people had inner struggles, they described it as being uh, something where people were facing, facing their demons, literally. And Jesus was able to come into her life and to be able to help her in that way. In our present day world, we have many more different ways of understanding our inner struggle than simply uh, the language that we use in the Bible. But what I think is important here is that in some ways, Mary was able to offer more hidden forms of resistance to the struggles that she was facing. And maybe people around her didn't see the struggles that she was going through or didn't understand exactly what was taking place. But some of the small steps that she took alongside of Christ allowed her to move out into the world and to begin to, um, to enter into places of strength and resistance that were more outward in, in her approach. We hear that Mary, alongside of a number of other women in that early Christian world, supported Jesus in his ministry. They supported him financially, and this would have been very difficult. We think even today of all the challenges and inequalities that still exist in our world between men and women and the pay gap that still exists. In this world, it would have been even more difficult. And yet, these three women that are described in the story, in the gospel story, have been able to um, offer forms of resistance to get to a place of financial security where they are actually supporting Jesus in his ministry, allowing him to live and thrive and make a difference in other people's lives as well. So it shouldn't be any wonder that Jesus chooses Mary to be the one who will go out and be an apostle to the apostles. She is somebody who has faced her inner demons. She is someone who has faced the systemic demons, we could say, of, of the economic stifling of women in that world. And finally, she was this individual who was able to face the Roman soldiers at the tomb. And I, 
what I love too, in terms of the story of Mary Magdalene, she is somebody who goes out and speaks to the disciples and lets them know about Jesus being risen from the dead. And at first, they don't believe. We hear that at first they thought that this was some kind of an idle tale that Mary was telling. She was being dismissed. But in so many of uh, the ancient uh, pieces of artwork that show Mary going and speaking, she has a finger raised like this to the disciples. And you see on the left. And some people think, okay, you know, she was in a teaching role. She had her finger forward like this. But whenever I see that image, I always think uh, more of, it, is anybody a basketball fan here? Did anybody watch basketball in the 1990s at all? Do you remember Dikembe Mutombo, who was one of the best defensive players in Zach Leander? So whenever he would block a shot, he would go up to people and he would start going like this and say, no, 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 that's not gonna happen in uh, my house. I love Dikembe Mutombo. He actually started getting technical fouls. They didn't want him to be doing that anymore. That's how I imagine Mary Magdalene on that day when she goes and tells the disciples and they say, what are you talking about? We don't believe you, go away. Can you imagine Mary going, no, you need to listen. There is new life. She is this presence of resistance and she goes to these disciples who are feeling frightened, but she is the embodiment of that line, fear is not love. Love will overcome the fear that we experience in our lives. Now, it would be wonderful to be able to say that no longer in our world are there the, the difficulties that someone like Mary would have faced, that there is no longer systemic violence, that there is no longer domestic violence in our world, that there is no longer war or strife or, or the taking advantage of our, our created world. And yet we know that in so many ways, there is still very much the presence of systems of domination in our world. It is so important still for us on this resurrection morning, on this Easter morning, to have an understanding that Christ's new life wasn't just a moment that happened 2,000 years ago, that isn't only a moment that affects our spiritual life, it affects every part of who we are. Body, mind, soul, spirit, it affects us as individuals, it affects us as families, it affects us as societies, and as a created world. We are a people that meet the risen Christ on this day. And we know that there will be those systems, those, those Roman guards that are still the presence of violence in our world. It is so important for us to resist those systems of, of violence. And maybe it starts as a hidden act of resistance in our world. Perhaps um, we know that all of us in some ways participate in systems that end up hurting other people. We are a people that, um, by the way that we live and the, the way that humanity lives today, impacts our environment in all kinds of different ways that are unhealthy for our world. We know that there are individuals who struggle with overcoming their own demons and their own situations of violence. It is so important for us to be able to offer resistance, to be with Christ and saying no to those tendencies in ourselves, to speak out against systems of domination or bigotry in our world, and to be able then to say yes to God's love, saying, yes to that promise of justice in our world, to be able to say yes to the compassion that is offered to us through the risen Christ. We are called to be Easter people, and that means making a difference in our world, starting in our inner life, moving out, and then going forward to change the world around us. As a people who say that Christ is risen, as people who proclaim this resurrection in our lives. Let us pray together these words. God of Easter morning, lead us to be your people of resistance who say, fear is not love. Help us to recognize that starting with our thoughts and prayers, you plant in us the seeds for transformation, resilience, 
We see conflict in the Holy Land and in Ukraine. We see the struggles of indigenous peoples in Canada. We see our own friends and families responding to illness and death or facing legacies of abuse. We see creation groaning for liberation. We struggle <coughs> amongst the tombs in our lives and long to find them empty. Give us hope, living God. Hope in our hands to open doors. Hope in our eyes to see possibilities. Hope in our heart to live by faith. For in hope, you roll away stones. Together, we pray the prayer of Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. said the boo, but I kind of love that <laughs> in the midst of our prayers, right? Because that's kind of like Jesus arrives, it's kind of like, boo! <laughs> we resist, we resist those powers of darkness to be able to say yes to God's love. Friends, come and join the resistance, for fear is not love. The fear of abuse and violence cannot keep us from nurturing hope in our hearts. The fear of death and loss cannot keep us from trusting in Christ's resurrection life. The fear of scarcity and want cannot keep us from sharing our gifts and our compassion. Let us dedicate our offerings as we sing together.
hands with me as we bless one another. Let's speak the words of this blessing responsibly. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. By death, he tramples down death, sin, and fear. For those in the tomb, he gives the blessing of life and love. Friends, as you go out from this place, carry these words. Fear is not love. Christ is risen. Christ brings about new life in us and others. Be a part of the resistance. Be a part of God's glory. Go out into the world with love. Thank you.